here we go. Hey, everyone. My guest today is John Rubenstein. John originated the title role in the Broadway musical Pippin, directed by Bob Fosse, and won the Tony and Drama Desk Awards for his performance in Children of a Lesser God. Some other Broadway appearances include Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, Ragtime, Hurley Burley, M. Butterfly, The K-Mutiny, Court Martial, Getting Away with Murder, Fools, Love Letters, and the 2013 Pippin Revival. Some of his TV credits include Family, Crazy Like a Fox, and over 300 other episodes. Some of his films include Being the Ricardos, Hello, I Must Be Going, 21 Grams, Red Dragon, The Boys from Brazil, and Someone to Watch Over Me. John is a theater director and a theater professor. He composes film and television music. He has hosted two classical music radio programs, played in a rock band, records audiobooks. His father was was Arthur Rubinstein, one of the greatest pianists of all time. And John is currently starring in a one-person play called Eisenhower, This Piece of Ground. And I am so, so thrilled to welcome you. Have you fallen asleep listening to just like a thumbnail uh, sketch of your, no, of, your it, of your credits? This makes me feel old. <laughs> no, you are not old. You are... Um, Prolific is what I would say. And um, we are going to talk about Eisenhower, this piece of ground, the one the one person play I saw the other day. And before we deep dive into that, um, I would love if you will uh, go on the journey with me to talk a little bit about, you know, there's no bearing the lead. Your father truly was one of the greatest artists of all time. And I wonder when you grow up in... Um, in a household like that, where there's that kind of discipline and focus on the art and the craft, and then there's all of this um, fame around it, did that make you want to run toward being performer or run away from being performer, a performer yourself? What was sort of the the vibe growing up around the arts as a profession? Well, you know, uh, probably it's true of anybody with any parent no matter what they do for a living, that you you just accept it. It's that's your life. If you you know live in a rural country and and your your parents work in the mines or you know serve food in a restaurant, that's your life. You don't think, oh, do I want to be in the restaurant business or do I want to run away from it? You don't. It's just oh yeah, mom's at work and dad's doing his thing and whatever it is. And that was the same way with us. Yes, our father was a great pianist and there was music in the house all the time, but um, that was just what it was. Do you know what I mean? Uh, we heard him play. And then uh, when we got a little bit older, we started going to see him play, hear him play in public, in concerts. Um, and that just was the routine. That was, the, that was what took place. So I didn't really entertain any cogent thoughts of, oh, I want to do this too, or, oh, gosh, I certainly would never want to do that. Neither one. It was just sort of, that was our life, you know? And then as, as you get older and older and you meet more people and you get out in the world, you say, oh, that was a pretty special, pretty rare, pretty wonderful way to get to grow up. And I absolutely acknowledge that and realize it. But when I was, you know, a kid, it was just dad. You know? Obviously, your dad uh, and you came up before social media, right? The the way people relate to well-known people is so different now. What was your dad's relationship to fame and how did that impact you? Huh, his, his relationship to fame. I don't know. Um, he was famous and and he played concerts like anywhere between 150 and 200 concerts a year all over the world all over america canada south america all over europe and in asia too um australia africa so he was always traveling he was always practicing at home not always but i mean Every every day there you'd hear something and you say, uh oh, I guess he's gonna play that next because he's working on that hard part. 
Uh, and then when he would show up to his concert, in my memory, <laughs> they were always sold out. I, I, I'm sure that, that, you know, people could make, you know, uh, analyses of the attendance of his concerts. But uh, in my memory, don't forget, he was 60 years old when I was born. So I came to him late in his career. He had started when he was a, a pre-teenager. So by the time I showed up, he was an extremely successful, well-known, famous uh, pianist. And uh, his concerts were always sold out. So that kind of relationship to fame was what he was used to. He was used to, you know, uh, I'm sure the, the Beyonce's of this world feel something similar. You know, they, they're they well known, they show up to do their job and people are going crazy and they're all there. And then otherwise fame uh, didn't hit him that much. You know, he he would go to a restaurant and somebody would come over to the table and say, oh my gosh, I heard you playing at Carnegie Hall and I loved it. Could you please sign this? And that kind of thing. But it wasn't constant because he wasn't a movie star. It wasn't his face that was that famous. It was his music. He sold a lot of records. And, you know, he loved being being appreciated and admired. He did, but it wasn't it wasn't an obsession. It wasn't something that, that one ever talked about. Can you tell me a little bit about your mom? My mom uh, was uh, the daughter of a great conductor and cellist and composer in Poland, Emil Mlinarski. And she, therefore, was in a very musical family herself. As a matter of fact, my father played a concert with uh, her father before she was even born. Uh, he was the soloist on the piano and, and Mlinarski was conducting the orchestra. He created the Warsaw Opera. And so my mother grew up in Warsaw, mostly listening to the opera and going through the secret passages. And, you know, uh, and then she became a dancer. She was a very talented dancer. And that was her young uh, sort of world. It was all music and dance. And then uh, she ran into my father and they got married. And uh, the rest was sort of history. So you're obviously incredibly musical. You have a deep understanding of music intellectually. Uh, and obviously it's in your DNA. And then you absorbed it through osmosis from what you're describing in terms of your household. Um, my brother-in-law, who's a psychiatrist, says that he knows your sister, one of your sisters. Do you have one sister or more than one sister? I have two sisters and one brother, and one of my sisters is a psychiatrist. Exactly. Yeah. So so, <laughs> so, not everyone became a performer. Um, someone had to help performers. So God bless your sister <laughs> um, and people who listen to us. So, so you... Um, you know, seeing that you also like compose film and television scores that you play, obviously you sing. My dog's name was Pippin. That's how much <laughs> um, I loved, loved, loved that show and how impactful listening to that cast recording was. It was one of my mom's favorites. Later, I got wow. to do a play that David Herson wrote. So to have no Roger Herson's son um, and then get to meet Roger. All of that was very heady, which brings uh -huh. me to getting to meet you today because you, both your television appearances and um, and your uh, Broadway life just really has inspired me and so many. So if you can talk mm -hmm. a little bit about, I feel like you could have gone really deep dived into a world of just music professionally. Um, and have, I mean, you've worn many hats, the acting bug, sort of where did the acting bug come from? Well, I guess it came um, for, from from two uh, real sources. Um, my parents were great theater goers. So um, from the earliest age that I can remember, we went to the theater. We went to movies, of course, as everybody did, and I love that. Um, but but we went to the theater. Uh, in, in We lived in New York. I, I was born in Los Angeles, but we moved to New York when I was very young. And uh, my oldest sister, Eva, was, first of all, a dancer and then an actress on Broadway, too. She was in the Diary of Anne Frank, the very original production of that. 
and uh, and in a musical called The Girl in Pink Tights <laughs> uh, with Zizi Jean Mail. So Broadway uh, performing was part of the family too. Um, and Wait, we went she, to the theater. I'm sorry to interrupt. Was she a, like a child actor? Or was this in her 20s? And, and In her 20s. Okay. 20s. She was a dancer when in her teens and she worked with um, Agnes DeMille a great deal. She was on wow. the road with Oklahoma where uh, Jack Cassidy and Shirley Jones met playing Curly and Laurie and she was oh in the dancing chorus. Your family, and, my God. Yeah, and then and then she created the role of Margot, the sister of Anne Frank, right. in the Diary of Anne Frank, and she did it for the whole Broadway run. And then she married a Presbyterian minister named William Sloan Coffin Jr., uh, who became very famous in the '60s. He was the chaplain of Yale University, and uh, so she, that her her life changed, and she became then a world class photographer. She is now about to go to Poland to get an honorary doctorate and have exhibits of her photographs shown all over the world. So, oh so my she's, God. she's had a sort of an amazing life too. I gotta, I gotta get out <laughs> more. <laughs> <laughs> but so we always went to the theater and living in New York in the 1950s and 60s, which is when I was growing up here. Um, that was, that is called sometimes the golden age of theater. God knows if it really is or not. But there were great plays and great musicals and great actors and writers and directors working. And I, on my allowance, could afford to go. That is sadly no longer the case. If there is a kid growing up in New York right now who loves the theater, <laughs> he or she gets to go maybe once or twice a year yeah. if they can cough up the money. But uh, basically, it's... Uh, it's an unaffordable and uh, very difficult situation. Yeah. But in my day, it was easy. So I saw everything. And if I loved it, I could see it twice or three times. I could sit up in the balcony and pay $4.50 and see the best shows in New York. As you then, remember that, what, <laughs> tell me like five of the, like the shows that you were like, oh my God, I can't believe I saw the original of. Oh, well. The list is endless. The very first Broadway show I ever saw was Wonderful Town. Uh, Leonard Bernstein wrote the music. Um, Condon and Green wrote the lyrics. And uh, Rosalind Russell and Eileen. Um, Eileen, uh oh, there it goes. I'm old and names go away from me, of course. That's okay. That's okay. George Gaines was opposite Rosalind Russell. And I worked with George decades later. and. Uh, was uh, very close to him. Oh. And that was the first show I saw. Okay. Then I, I, th I guess the second show I saw was my sister's, the musical, uh, A Girl, The Girl in Pink Tights. I saw the original My Fair Lady. I was at opening night of Camelot with wow. uh, Richard Burton and Julie Andrews. Wow. Um, I, I went as a young teenager just because I saw everything. I went to a play I'd never heard of the author. Um, it was called Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? And I staggered out of that theater mm -hmm. and just walked around Manhattan for a couple of three hours, just trying to process what that play did to me with Uta Hagen and Arthur Hill, Melinda Dillon and George Grizzard. I'll never forget that. And I mean, I could go on and on and on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the rest of your time talking about all those plays. Well, how fun would that be? But I get it. That is the golden <laughs> age. And, and how impactful and inspiring to see work at that level and go, okay, if I want to do this, I have to be at that level. And so and simultaneously, I had the great good fortune. And this really is just one of those strokes of luck. My parents sent me here in Manhattan to a school called St. Bernard's. St. Bernard's, but it's pronounced St. Bernard's because it's British. And it was established and uh, staffed mostly by British masters, teachers, when I went there. And uh, it, it finished in the eighth grade. Eighth grade was the graduating class. And all boys. And those British people took and take their public speaking and presentations extremely seriously. I've raised five children and I've, you know, brought them all up in American schools and taken them 
and seen all their stuff. But I did notice, except for my one son who went also to St. Bernard's, that mostly it's just to, you know, they make the kids get on stage and they learn their little gestures and they learn their little songs and they play the whatever they play and they run around and they have a great time and it's wonderful fun. And the parents come and they go, oh, there's little Sally and look at her, isn't she cute in her little costume? But basically it's not taken seriously. It's just fun for the kids and fun for the parents. But it's at St. Bernard's. It was serious. It was like math class. It was like getting your your you know your history lesson correct. You learned your part. You stood up on that stage when I was in fourth grade. I did a Mozart um, operetta, Bastien and Bastienne. I played the girl Bastienne because I had a good little soprano voice. We all played the women's parts. And there was never any teasing or any weirdness about it. We loved those parts just as much as anybody else. When I was in fifth grade, I played Peter Pan in the original play by J.M. Barry, the one that played in London, uncut the whole play. And we ran around the stage. We didn't fly, you know, <laughs> we pretended to fly. And we had Wendy and Tinkerbell and Captain Hook and the crocodile and Smee. And it was fantastic. And then when I was in uh, seventh grade, our seventh grade homeroom teacher was the man who taught the eighth grade Shakespeare play. Every year, the eighth grade graduating class did an, uh, an entire uncut play by Shakespeare. And the seventh grade homeroom teacher was the director of that. He also wrote the Piero show, which your seventh grade class did. You put on the British clown Piero costumes and uh, you did skits that he wrote, uh, topical review type stuff. Um, so in seventh grade, you learned your play that you were going to do the next year. And in my seventh grade year, it was Macbeth. And we read Macbeth out, out loud in class all year long, full school year. Every boy in the class read every role at least once or twice or three times. And by the time, and, and the teacher explained us about the Elizabethan theater and uh, all the references in Shakespeare, the sexual ones and the mythological ones and the historical ones and all of the stuff. So that by the time we were getting out of seventh grade, we knew that play, we knew every word in it, we knew what it was about, what it meant, what the characters, uh, backstories were and uh, you were cast then I was given the role of Macbeth and over the summer you learned your part and you came back now as an eighth grader and in December of that year you presented the play one time they rented out Hunter College Theater and we presented it there now in sixth grade he needed extras so I was a fairy in the Tempest uh, which was the eighth grade play that year and so I was at all the rehearsals of The Tempest, and I learned that play and was in it. In seventh grade, we did that Piero show, but we also, he did Henry V for the eighth grade. And I had the part of The Boy, which was a great role. Uh, he had a, a monologue all by himself on stage. When all the funny guys leave, he says, I'm going to go and fight the war for my king. Great, great moment. So I learned Henry V and did that play in seventh grade. And as I said, in eighth grade, we did Macbeth. So by the time I was 13, I had already done three Shakespeare plays in full, not just little adaptations of them. And um, I wanted to be an actor because during those same years, I was also going to the theater all the right. time, the real theater. And when we would travel in Europe, which we did every year, we went to London and we would go to the old Vic and we would see all the plays on the West End and in Paris too. How old were you Comédie when you Francaise. made, how old were you when you made your Broadway debut? Pippin was your debut. Is that correct? My Broadway debut. Yeah. 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 So how uh, old were 25. you? 25. I was 25. Okay. Young. That's young to yeah, be. that's young. Yeah. To be, car you know, to be, the, the show was called Pippin and you were Pippin. So. Right. 
I mean, it's really amazing listening to you. You know, this this episode will live both as a podcast and as a visual video on YouTube, oh. um, which thrills me to no end because the way you just described all of those middle school shows, yeah, a as if it were yesterday. Like literally, I am now. Oh yeah. On that road with you, I can see the teacher, the costumes, the the kids. Um, and, and you know, in terms of like the Malcolm Gladwell 10,000 hours of something, and then uh -huh. the the luck of, of, of getting a chance to do it in the way that you got to do it. Um, I had read somewhere that you had met Bob Fosse, and you can tell me if this is apocryphal or true, that you had originally met Fosse because Michael York was maybe not going to be able to do the film of cabaret is that a true story or a or... yes okay yes, absolutely okay so you had developed a, a relationship <clears> with him <throat> and then i read someplace else that your wife had known him because she had done a show with him yeah she was a dancer on broadway my first wife okay um and she was in pal joey okay which he directed choreographed and played pal joey in, right at, at city center before I met her. Would, would you say by the time you're auditioning or or you'll say what the process was to get Pippin, would you say that you thought of Bob Fosse as a friend? Um, no. Okay. Were you no, no, not at intimidated all. by him? No, not okay. intimidated. No. Okay. I, I auditioned for him to take over uh, the Michael York part in, uh, in Cabaret. And the audition was a screen test because in those days, that's what you did. You you went to a studio, they had, there was a crew and a camera and a set. And there was a young woman who, who read the Sally Bowles part. And I did two scenes for him you know, with my British accent uh, because they wanted him to be British. And by the way, uh, I'm sure you have a perfect British accent because all your teachers were British at St. Yeah, yeah it's pretty easy for me because of that. <laughs> yes, that's awesome. <laughs> and I think he was going to cast me. I can't say that for 100% sure. But, you know, you sometimes you just get that feeling that's going to happen. And then Michael York fixed his schedule. So that did not happen. But then uh, about whatever, eight, nine months later, he would finished shooting. And uh, we got a phone call at home uh, out of the blue. And I said, hello. Hi, John, this is Bob Fosse. I said, oh, gosh, well, geez, how are you? How did Cabaret go? He said, it went fine. Uh, can you sing? I said, well, uh, sort of, yes. I've, I've done musicals. I, I had done a big tour of On a Clear Day You Can See Forever for seven months. I, I sang all my life in different shows, but I would never call myself a singer, I said. He said, well, can I come over? Uh, I said, yeah, sure. So m my wife made a lovely dinner and he did come over. And after dinner, uh, I went to the piano and I played him two Laura Nero songs. I, I loved Laura Nero, N-Y-R-O for your listeners who've never yes, heard of her. Yes, and she's just, <clears throat> you know, for those listening, you actually know many Laura Nero songs, even if That's you're not right. sure who Laura Nero is. And her songwriting inspired, among many others, Stephen Schwartz tremendously, but also a lot of the very, very famous pop singer songwriters that we all know. Yeah, Laura Nero had a lot to do with with their awakenings. Yeah, but anyway, so I I knew Laura Nero songs and I played them and sang them for Bob, and he said, "Okay, that's fine." And then we sat down on the couch and he had brought the script of Pippin. And he read all the parts, and I read Pippin. And we read through the whole play. And then he left. He said, thanks for dinner. And then uh, my wife, we, we were about to have our first child. So she was very pregnant at that moment. We went to bed sort of early. But our bedroom door was the first one you came to in the hills when you walked up the steps. So we're just turning out the light and bang, bang on the door. I said, uh-oh. In those days, you didn't, you didn't worry. So I just opened the door and there was Bob. Uh -huh. And he said, here's a, a tape. Listen to the second song and learn it and come to New York in three days. So I did. I uh, The second song was Corner of the Sky. The first song was Magic to Do. Mm -hmm. And it was Stephen Schwartz playing and singing the entire score. That was oh, the tape. Awesome. Yeah. So I learned uh, Corner of the Sky off of that tape. 
I flew to New York, uh, and there was an audition. And then there had been, I think in the New York Times, there had been an ad saying any young actor between the ages of 18 and 35 who wants to play Pippin in the new, not Pippin, the title role in the new Bob Fosse musical, um, show up at the, I think it was the Majestic, I, if I'm not mistaken, theater, and uh, we'll, you can audition. So I had an appointment and two or three others had appointments to sing, but uh, there was this line. There's an open the call. Block, going down 8th Avenue, all these oh guys of different ages. It was a hippie day. So some of them were hippies with very long hair and beads and funny clothes and guitars. And others were sort of straight laced young men just out of acting school. You know, it was it was excellent. That's so I went in there and I, I went down into the orchestra pit and played the piano and looked up and sang my two Laura Nero songs for Stephen and for Stuart Ostro and for Roger, her son, um, and Bob. And then I got up on the stage. They had an accompanist and I sang Corn of the Sky, which I had learned. And... Um, then I stood there for about a minute or two and they all talked. And then Bob came running down the aisle to the foot of the stage and looked up at me and said, parts yours if you want it. Are you and kidding? That, that was that. So, wow. Did you, did you, um, did you understand at the time? I mean, listen, I came up, you know, my Broadway career, you know, there were either offers to someone or you know you didn't find out in the moment in the room quite like that there were well, it's, it's it's kind of corporate yeah. now like the number of people who have to weigh in even if the director does want you it, right. it just doesn't work that way anymore did you understand in that moment first of all your wife's about to have a baby so not only are you going to have your broadway debut that also means moving back to new york so your child is born in New York? No, she was born in LA in February and we started rehearsals in July. That okay. audition was in, it was in February. Okay, so there was a minute. Um, so obviously there's, you know, for people who weren't born yet or didn't live in New York when that show happened, uh, there are many clips that you can see. There's Tony performances. I mean, that, that cast recording and whatever film there is of that show is available and incredible. And you're such a little baby peanut in that show. But <laughs> then you got to come back to that piece in what I would imagine was the much easier part as Pippin's father years later. Um, I mean, Diane Paulus really is such a, a magical direct. She, she's such a visionary in the way that she, um, take something you think you know and, and gives it a new language. Was, yeah. What was that something like similarly, like your phone rings one day and it's Diane saying, hey, do you want to do this? Or was there more to it getting the revival? No, no, they, they, no, they made me audition, you know, uh, against all the other old guys <laughs> are who you were. Kidding? Uh, Terrence Mann was cast. Okay. Uh, uh, I, I wasn't even talked to. And then when Terry was about to leave, that's when they held this big audition. I don't know what the audition was that he got. Mm -hmm. Maybe they just called him up and asked him to do it. Right. Or maybe he auditioned amongst a bunch of guys. I, that I, story, I don't know. Yeah. But by the time it came down to me, it was a year uh, or not quite a year later. And he was leaving. And so they, uh, I you know, ran into two or three of my old, friends there auditioning against me and we all you know traded stories and uh yeah and then they auditioned me once and then they called me back again and they made me audition a second time uh for the Weislers because they weren't there at the first audition and um and then they called me I think later that day or maybe the next day I think it was that same day um and told me that they wanted me to do it I think people will be very surprised and it's very humbling to hear that Tony Award winner, John Rubenstein, Emmy nom I mean, you, you've won many awards, you've been nominated for all of them, still auditioned, not even for the lead, that that is some, and that you went in uh, to do it. 
Of course, of course. I mean, so talk about is, auditioning throughout uh, your like, like there have to be times where you must have been like, "Are you kidding?" There's seven thousand hours of me on film that you can look at. Here's my Tony. How do you remain <laughs> humble or willing? Well, I don't know if it's either humble or willing. It's just you need to work, and if people come to your house with flowers and scripts and leather cases and beg you to be in their film or in their show. That's lovely. But if they don't <laughs> and they say, well, uh, we've seen your work or we've heard your name and we would like to see you uh, audition, mm -hmm. then you audition. Mm -hmm. It's not a matter of ego or, you know, how come you don't know who I am? It's just, that's, you know, especially you get, you keep getting older and the people who are making all these decisions, whether they're network executives or corporate, God knows who, or new young directors and writers and producers, they didn't catch you in Pippin because they weren't born yet. Right. So, you know, they, they didn't name, name their dog a, Pippin like I did. Exactly. So, you know, they, they want to see you. They have yeah. a big part or something important. It's their big thing. They've put a lot of money and time and energy into it. They're not going to just call you up on the phone because somebody says, oh, yeah, he's very good. Mm -hmm. No, no. They need to see you in person and see you say their words and sing their songs. And I, I fully respect auditions, even right. if it's somebody you know. Right. Um, well, you're a director, so you also understand you're, you're putting a family together, right? Yeah. And there's, there's, I want to, um, because I know, first of all, I want to be respectful of your energy and your voice, because I, I'm going <laughs> to jump, I'm going to jump 20 years or, or 10 from, from the revival of Pippin, um, because we could really deep dive into family was like such an important TV show for me. And then also, um, you know, the children of a lesser God and, and, and even came in court martial. I mean, I mean, it's really been what an incredible career, but what wasn't on your resume was a one person show. Um, and so I want to say two things. One, how thrilling to get to see you do this the other day. B, my mother, Helen Levine has a word, it's called fumfer and she'll see a show and she'll say either someone didn't fump for it all or they did. And that's when they get tripped up on their words a little, right? Like, like that's just, I don't know if it's in the dictionary or just in the dictionary of Helen Levine. So you are, I've seen many, many one person shows, usually maybe at most they're 90 minutes without an intermission, generally 75. Um, this is a full length play that you are doing by yourself yeah. and you did not thump for one time John. <laughs> and not that well, it would even glad. matter if you did because who cares <laughs> right it's i mean that's not that's not the benchmark of an amazing or not amazing performance but it was incredible for me to watch you on a matinee day um and sometimes we're actually mm. less in it in in a matinee just we haven't been up long enough uh, compared to a nighttime <laughs> show. We're actors. Right. We stay up late. Um, anyway, <clears throat> so of all the things you could do and of all the, I mean, A, you should just write your a one-man show about your life because it's extraordinary. Um, but you chose to do somebody else's life for your first one-man show. As far as I know, maybe there's another one-man show I don't know about. Is there? Nope. Okay. Okay. So was this like a bucket list thing? Like, I want to do a one man show. Can I still do? I mean, that's a lot of lines, by the way. And I know it's annoying when people say, how do you learn all those lines? But Jesus, this is a big show and you're by yourself out there. And what do you do when you do forget a line? Like, have you had to, what do you do? I, uh, I just keep talking. <laughs> I can talk for half an hour. Uh, it, it won't have anything to do with the play. <laughs> But I can, I'll still be as an hour and I'll say, well, yeah, Mamie came up with a beautiful yeah. dress one day. She came in. I said, well, honey, where'd you get that dress? And she said, so it's and meanwhile, my, my brain is thinking, what am I supposed to be talking oh about? Oh my God, that's yeah. so scary, but that it's so liberating. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, of all the 
people you could do it about or I mean let me just say as a viewer you think you know a little bit about many presidents it's really exciting to <laughs> learn a lot about one um I was unbelievably struck by the I, I don't know why it hadn't dawned on me that because of his leadership as a general during World War II that because he was in charge liberating the camps, that is why we have footage, documented footage of the Holocaust in the way we do. Um, that's right. That's mentioned in the play. Again, I don't know if that was his command or if that was happening. At, you know, he's, no, he that was, was absolutely at, that his, was his idea. Yeah. It made me think of your dad who went back to Poland post-war to play in that country as a as a Jew who had escaped to America or maybe was already in America before the war. Um, no, they lived in Paris and they left. They the whole escaped. family, your dad's whole family. My dad, my mother and my older sister and brother. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, that's a whole other conversation, what it might have been like for your dad to go back. Um but but those themes, knowing that and knowing a little bit of your history made it all the more rich to kind of learn that part of Eisenhower's mm -hmm. history. Was that part of the draw for you, understanding his place in history in that way and without him, what we wouldn't know to a certain degree? No, to be really honest, yeah. um, I was sent the play. I thought, uh-oh. This is going to be very difficult to memorize. <laughs> yes. And I'm not sure if anybody wants to sit for two hours and hear Eisenhower talk about his life. Right. But the author and the director, Peter Ellenstein, and the author is Richard Hellison, um, asked me to come and read it for them out loud, which I did. And when I was finished, all three of us said, Okay, we got to do this. So that's how that happened. I didn't pick it or choose it or you and think you about had it. fun. It was fun to do it. Well, <laughs> I don't mean fun no, like I going never to Disney, but you it was not fun. Well, well, it when was is very, it fun? very hard and challenging. But when? So where is the fun? Because there's got to be some oh, element well, no, of fun. You're right. No, I, yeah. I'm being curmudgeonly. It was fun. It's always fun. It you know I, I I love the work I do I always do, but sometimes it's really really difficult, and then you're not having fun you're sort of working you're walking up a steep hill in a yeah. blinding snowstorm yeah. and you're trying to make it to the top without falling on your butt, so is that fun Yeah I guess so but not not entirely so well, I do love doing this play mostly you do. because of the way it's written. Yeah. It's a brilliantly written piece of yeah. theater. And it's well and structured. And people listen to it and they get informed and they also get inspired to think in these political times, what we're going through right now yeah. and what we have been for some years, to, to hear the words and see and learn the actions of a great, powerful man, arguably the most powerful man in the 20th century, if mm -hmm. you want you know mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, who was so humble and whose main concern was to improve the lives of the people he was responsible for the citizens of the united states not just his party or the people who screamed at him when they met him but everybody he wanted to make people's lives better and when he was a general in the army he wanted to make the soldiers lives better he was concerned about the food that they were being given and took interest in it and made it be better and talked to them personally about their lives so that they would remember that they weren't just being used as cannon fodder but they were individual young men and women who were being asked to do a tremendously self-sacrificing selfless thing for their country and for the world. So he was that kind of guy. And when people listen to the play, they get that. And that's what that's what's fun. I love being able to bring an inspirational kind of idea to people of these days, both young and old, who are 
suffering. I know I have kids, they're suffering, they're mad. Yeah. What's the matter with everything, with everybody? Yeah. Why is everything so screwed up? Yeah. Why is everybody so angry at everybody else? And why is there so much injustice in this country and in the whole world? And they hear a guy like Eisenhower saying, okay, it's possible for there to be a president of the United States who cares about the people he represents, not just about himself, his image, any way he can make money, any way he can exert influence, but about the people he serves, the word service. When you're the president of the United States, you don't rule America, you serve America. And that's what Eisenhower represented. And I must say, in my relatively longish lifetime, of all the presidents, and I've respected and, and admired many of them, Joe Biden, with all of his age and his faults and all the some really wrong choices that he's making even yesterday that I disagree with, he is the closest to an Eisenhower type president one who really gets that his job is to is to bring together people in the in the congress people in the judiciary people in states and citizens and try to make everybody's life better and i i i admire him for that well people in new york right now um can see Eisenhower, this piece of ground at um, the theater at St. Clemens, which I have gotten to see so many great productions there. Yeah, it's a years. good house. It's so cool. Yeah. It's so cool going back there, and it's um, it just has a, a tremendous history, both as a, a church and then as you know, with when Handman and just tons and tons of amazing productions. And the staff there, by the way, they're just the nicest, just on top of everything. Oh, good. I yeah. loved the I Like Ike merchandise. It's really, it's really great. It's so great to get to spend time with you, both in the theater, watching you and getting to be with you today. Mm -hmm. And John, I need to ask you before we finish, um, is there a little known fact about you that you can share on the Little Known Facts podcast? It can be anything. <laughs> anything gosh little known fact mm -hmm. about me yeah oh boy um what would i say i don't know of, of anything interesting that anybody would want to know um i uh i once packed up my bicycle with my oldest son, Michael, my second child, long time ago, and we packed up our our bicycles in boxes, put them in a plane, um, and we got off in the airport in in um, Cincinnati, Ohio, and we put our bikes together, and uh, we rode up through. Uh, along the Ohio River and up into Indiana, up uh, to Bloomington uh, over over uh, several days. And another time we packed up our bikes and we flew to, to Shreveport, uh, Louisiana. And we, again, assembled our bikes in the airport and we rode down the Mississippi River through Baton Rouge and everything and down to New Orleans where we spent a long time. Well, and, I have um, a little known those fact. Those were two of the great trips of my life. That's Michael Weston. And some of you guys might know That's him. Correct. He's a wonderful actor. Um, I I spent time with him in LA and uh then when he did Snake Bit in New York, and I I um oh. I I uh love that you brought up a Michael Weston story. That is a perfect <laughs> way to end this. Um John, thank you for coming on the podcast. What a thrill. And uh, folks, go see Eisenhower, this piece of ground while it's in New York, but I'm sure it will tour and have a life over and over again. So wherever you live, you'll probably get to we see close, it. We close on October 27th. Okay, in New which York. Which is coming up. Yeah, in it's New coming York. up. So, so hurry up. Come see it. Yeah, yep. and hopefully, they sh hopefully they'll film it. So, you know, not everyone can get to New York and... Right. I don't know. That's my suggestion. Have a glorious day. Have a great show tonight. And thanks for being Thank on the podcast. So
Great talking to you. Great talking to you. All right. Have a great day. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye.